as we're going on a trip. Tinley bound. <laughs> we're going to Tinley and uh, we're going to bring you guys along. Obviously, we have a lot of stuff going on beforehand, so you guys are good to see it. We're, we're with Danner Constrictors with us. John Danner from Danner Constrictors. He's the tag along this time. He's uh, right. going to be making things Captain fun. Of the ship. Tag Captain of the ship. <laughs> Well, this video uh, is made possible by uh, Danner Constrictors. Yeah, he's he's paying for the whole thing. <laughs> he doesn't know it yet. <laughs> That's a nice deal you got. Check Stay tuned. Well, okay. <laughs> All right. show you guys a sneak peek behind the scenes kind of deal because we're at Ryan McVeigh's <laughs> house and Erica's house and they have an awesome personal collection and they also have friends of scales <laughs> reptile rescue and so we're gonna take a look around we're gonna show you some cool animals and uh, Ryan's gonna tell us just kind of what he's working with and what he's gone through his passions yeah so is that cool absolutely let's do it all right well, yeah we can get into it yeah so um, just kind of as a basis so um, over the years I've kept enormous amount of species um used to do a lot with geckos there was points where i had you know me and four people in the world had certain species in captivity i was breeding and working with and always loved geckos but after having four kids like being down there for three hours a night just wasn't as much of a thing anymore so um kind of switched gears and i think i was like every reptile keeper like i found something cool and i got a pair and i found something cool and i bought a pair and then, yeah. then i had a rack like a little ba you know baby rack that was like mm -hmm. australia madagascar south america like all over the place so I wasn't giving anybody the right parameters like they were all within range but it wasn't optimal yeah and uh, and then it got overwhelming and it just wasn't fun anymore so I got to a point and I said I you know, talked I was like you know if I if everything I hatched I just gave away for free and I didn't make money and it was nothing just for me what would I keep because I loved it and that's what I did Smart. I got rid of everything that I didn't keep or I didn't want just because I loved it and that's what we do now me and Erica work with a bunch of species that we nerd out over every freaking day we've had them for years and we're, every time we see them we get excited mm -hmm. um and if they hatch if I get babies that's super cool if not we just appreciate them we just love them so it's fun yeah. and it takes that edge off it takes that pressure of like oh is this female gonna breed this year or not mm -hmm. it takes that off of it now I just I can sit back here in a chair and just watch stuff and then it's cool yeah, that's what uh, Ryan and John were talking about earlier. It's like the difference between a breeder and a, and a collector, you know, like this is just beautiful setups you have and um, we can tell you really care about keeping your animals right and it just looks awesome. You guys can see that some of the, the lights are slowly shutting yeah. off because it's, it's nighttime. Yeah. Um, we'll have to, you know, shine some lights. <laughs> and these, these are all on, so inside here, you can, we'll, we'll get to that, but like it's all the Zilla Pro Soul low profile lights mm -hmm. and they're all self timered. So in order to stop this from happening, I have to go through each and turn them all off. So, it, but for, I mean, for every other day except the day you guys come, it's totally cool because they turn yeah. themselves off. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome, right? But no, this whole wall. So this is our snakes, and um, yeah, we kind of we I've done racks, and I don't have a problem with racks for anybody that's all like, oh, racks yeah. are the worst. Like they're not, but they have their place in my opinion. Like if you're a breeder and you're looking at production, and you, you can't have this for five hundred yeah. ball pythons plus. It's a huge waste of space for a rock that doesn't go anywhere. Right. Much. So yeah, and that's what we say. You know, it depends on the species. Like right. some species actually do better in a rack, like a ball python. Well, and they but spend, then others don't. Yeah, they spend twenty-two of the twenty-four hours of the day in the wild in a hole. Like, yeah. Like racks, perfect. Yeah. Like exactly. this would just freak them out constantly. Versus you know other species like these guys are just constantly checking us out and watching and you know yeah. and, and that's they're they're it's a different species so and that's the other the other thing too is like even with the herb society and the stuff we do um, anybody that mentions a rack to mm -hmm. a kid I'll slap them because <laughs> like yeah. you don't want that like you get these guys that build like one tub rack yeah like, yeah it's gonna go into the kid's bed he's never gonna look at it again he's gonna get bored with the animal it's not gonna be fun anymore right. Like, Dude, I'd rather they be, I tell them how to build out a cool tank, even if it is for a ball python. They yeah. Build out a cool tank for that one pet and treat yeah. it like a pet. You yeah. know, there's there's a place for breeding in that production style, and there's a place for you know pets, and there's all the in between. But it's mm -hmm. all about getting people to appreciate the animals too. Like you guys can have a whole bunch of drawers, but you love all your snakes. You know what's in every one. You know their personalities. Yeah, yeah. Versus like if somebody who's just getting into it, it's easy for them to just get busy and not care as much and then that animal suffers for that so sure um but anyway so yeah so we we've done racks in the past um 
just because we had so many and it was kind of our goal to keep moving towards bigger open caging and um and again though we had to severely reduce what we kept focused mm -hmm. a lot um and a lot of our focus moved on to like indonesian and south like south pacific pythons um mm -hmm. and australian pythons and that's just something yeah. i've always loved so sure. <clears throat> kind of going through some of these these are this is a pair of maclots pythons he's kind of crazy i'm surprised he's not trying to bite me she's not too bad um, but what's cool with this girl, other than the fact that she's up this high, <laughs> is, come here, come here, Narcissa. Come on. Uh, they're also super, the other thing with like Lyasis and a lot of the spike species we keep is they're super uh, bipolar. So like one day she's a puppy dog and I can hand her the kids and the next day she's trying to eat my face. Mm -hmm. Oh, stop it, come here. Uh, uh, like that. <laughs> That's easier way to get her out. Still not food. Yeah? Oh, I'll give her a minute, she'll let go. I just talk like this. <laughs> so, <laughs> come here often? Yeah, what brings you here? It's real fun. This is awesome. I don't know what you want to do. Closer. So nothing at all happened at all, we're just back. Hey, we're back. <laughs> Ryan showed us some of his animals. Get a little bit of snafu. <laughs> snafu? Oh, okay, so. It was a Savu, not a Snafu. A Savu? Alright. Maclots. Maclots. Yeah, it's a Maclots. <laughs> he has a pair of those. We're gonna move on. <laughs> hey, sure, you can you can get around if you want. No, like, it's way fun. Up here in the top here, they're hidden, but you can see this one. These are Savu pythons. So her I don't want to mess with because she's about two weeks away from laying eggs. Which, is, all, which is awesome. Dude, I've been I've been trying she's twelve years old. I've been trying to breed her for ten years. That's so awesome. They're not, they're not one that you just like throw together and you get babies. There you go. So she's probably also gravid, but she's a little easier to deal with. Um, and she's really unique looking for a Sabu. So this is actually a really big Sabu too. The female up there is a lot smaller. So these guys, when, they're, when they hatch, they're mm -hmm. neon orange with orange eyes. And as they get bigger, they actually turn black with okay. white eyes. For some reason, this one is really silvery and orange. Um, I was talking to Dave Barker and I showed it to him and I'm like, is it a locality thing? And he's like, he's like Ryan, Savu Island's four miles by 14 miles. There's no localities. <laughs> and he's like, you should breed it and see what happens. It looks, you know, really unique. Looks cool, yeah. So I think she's gravid too. We'll probably hold back the babies just because she's cool looking. I want to see if there's anything to it. There's these yeah. weird like light blotches that just went through your hand. Yeah. Just like, I don't there's know what it is. There's some up in here still. Yeah, it's and like my other cool. ones have the orange still, but they're almost all black and dark. Like they're okay. not this light. So. We're just gonna play with it and see what happens. Either way, I love Savos. They're mm -hmm. just like the Maclots, they're psycho little babies and they're generally really cage aggressive, but when you get them out, they're puppy tame. You know, they, they yeah. really settle down. Um, it's just a territorial thing. So mm -hmm. like we've got some babies I'll show you in a little bit, but they're gonna come launching out of the tubs and try and kill all of us. And Sounds they're like a little plan. tiny orange worms that are 12 inches long. <laughs> but, Sounds cool. Right, so, um, and these guys just don't see anymore. They came in, in the mid 90s they were redis they were dis uh, described in 1994 um and then they started coming in in the late like not too long after that and they were very difficult to breed even as captives but as wild caught they were super difficult and they were super ornery and aggressive so nobody wanted to work with them mm -hmm. so they kind of just faded out and then gotcha. like with a lot of other morph breeding and things like that and the way the industry turned towards more of the cresties beardies ball pythons called even just more beginner snakes to feed that industry to start yeah. um people moved away from a lot of these weird, obs less, more obscure species. Yeah, yeah. Because there's not as much of a, I can't just turn it around real quick. Like no pet store yeah. wants to buy this from me because the babies are cycled little mean, ass, little, little yeah. mean jerks. Um, like this is a snake I really love. This is one I picked up at Daytona this last year. Okay. This is a little baby Timor python. Okay. So this one, we named her Biscuit. Because uh, Erica names everything after Harry Potter characters, if you'd notice most of the names on the cages. Yeah. Uh, and I don't watch Harry Potter, so it dr drives me nuts. So I brought home this huge, fe this nice big female and named it Waffle, just to be a jerk. <laughs> and then I just stuck with it. So this one's Biscuit, the other one's Bagel, and she hates saying it every time she has to say <laughs> the name. Which is, it works for me. That's so, great. But these guys are cool. So they're Timor Pythons and they're uh, Maleo Python Timorensis. So, and anytime you hear Ensis at the end of a Latin name, it means from, so from Timor. These have never lived on Timor Island. <laughs> so they're actually from Lesser Sunda Island. Um, and, but when they were originally collected, they mislabeled where they got them. Yeah. And they just got named Timorensis. So, they, so they've always been Timor pythons, but they've never lived on Timor. Wow. 
That's interesting. Yeah, a little weird, fact. little weird sure. little tidbit. But these guys are cool just because like the color, the pattern going down their neck, um, and then it just fades. And these are actually when they got reclassified into Maleo Python, they're now more closely related to the Super Dwarf Retix than anything else. Oh, I can see that actually. So you can actually see it in the head and like yeah. the more deep head scales. Yeah. Um, and the if anybody ever wants to own one of these, expect that basically they turn their butt into like a poop and urate sprinkler the second <laughs> you touch them. She doesn't do that as much, so we're trying to keep working with her and yeah, try to keep that at bay because all of my other Timors, if you touch them, so we, like they just start crapping on you. So we'll take, we'll grab their tail and I'll tail them around the cage until they empty out, then take them out. <laughs> Otherwise, they just cover the walls, you, the floor. Um, but no, she's a, she's just a super cool little baby. That's awesome. This is a. <laughs> so just in case, as you come over to the house, this was the housewarming gift that Garrett brought. So yeah, step it up. No, <laughs> Apparently, but, I have uh, we have food. Thank you. Yeah, I brought food, dude. I, it's not a, I didn't know that I should be bringing uh, reptiles <laughs> in. I probably no. should have. No. Well, this is Erica's pet. We got one from him uh, before, and it had so it had to, it passed away of a weird like genet congenital issue, um, and she was pretty bummed about it. So when he came over and brought Kira and hung out for the weekend, he brought this as a gift, which is pretty awesome. So it was one of his super <laughs> dwarfs. Um, and it was and really it's, cool. It's hundred percent too, right? That's it's awesome. a it's a it's a it's a mix. But it's, I believe this one's 100% super dwarf. It's just different localities. Okay. Um, I think it's got a little jampea in it. Um, but this one was one that he kind of held back. He had a, rel a brother to it um, that he uses because it's just super clean and really, really pretty. Mm -hmm. um, and he didn't really have a plan for this one, but it was really pretty. So he was holding on to it. And then, he, you know, he brought it over for Erica, which is pretty cool. So now this guy does education with us. And it's pretty cool to have this and then have a full-size retic that some of yeah. the other Herb Society members have. And when this guy's five years old and they're two, yeah, yeah, you know, and kind of show that you know the responsible side of keeping retics, you can keep an animal that you can actively manage, um, yeah. give a proper habitat to, and, and mm. provide better husbandry for, because these guys are super arboreal, yeah, you know. So the fact that we're keeping a twenty-foot arboreal snake in a drawer, I want to bash anything in the hobby, but that just, I just, that doesn't sit well with me. Yeah. So I really like what Garrett's doing with a lot of the super dwarf stuff and bringing a lot more of that into the market so that it's not even just the coolness of the super dwarf to me, it's that yeah. it's really allowing people to be better responsible keepers. Yeah, and it's definitely more accessible at that point. Exactly. Yeah, especially, you know, we were talking about this earlier, if you see like little kids leaving a, a, a reptile show with a baby retic and you're like, oh no, or, or like, on our, yeah. or something venomous, and you're right. like, <laughs> <laughs> well, especially um, like here in like Illinois, Wisconsin, where me and Erica are the go-tos for confiscations and stuff, and like it kills me when I see that because I'm like, cool, I'll see you in a couple months. Yeah, you know, and it sucks. I don't want to do that. You know, I'd rather reach out to people and educate them about how they can do. There's better ways. There's better options. Yeah, and with this guy, you get. All the intelligence of the retic, all the pretty, I mean, all the prettiest and cool pattern. They're, I think they're more iridescent than the main lens. They're way more interesting. Their mannerisms are a little different. Their colors mm -hmm. are a little different. But cool. yeah, they're rad. And I mean, but this is a super easy manageable size to deal with. Oh yeah. This is unbelievable. And this is like three, four years old. This is a, a this is, I think it's four and a half now. Yeah, four and a half. Yeah. Four and a half year old retic. Just wrap your mind around that, right? I mean, this thing's maybe a thousand. Heck, it's not even a thousand grams. This thing's probably like six or eight hundred grams. Unbelievable. For us, that's Garrett Hartle at uh, Reach Out Reptiles. Yeah. So you guys can check him out. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's he's just cool guy. what he's doing, and he's working all of the morphs down into high percentage super dwarfs, and mm -hmm. working really hard to kind of keep with that that end goal of pure localities and the ones he's working with that aren't. He's just trying to breed more small animals into him so he might be and just all the stuff he knows is awesome he's a cool guy to talk to and just kind of mm -hmm. hear some of his his work too that's but, awesome great yeah this is a super cool animal that we just he's just a pet i want to get him a girlfriend she doesn't <laughs> so <laughs> we were talking about that earlier anytime that you like have an animal you're like you know i kind of really want something to read it like ryan right. every time that he gets anything his wife's like hey i'd really like this he's like well you gotta get two and I, and part, of it, part of it I feel is like the, the, the breeder collector like just reptile lover yeah, yeah. but like for, for these guys it's not that it's 
I feel like it's almost a social responsibility if we have something like this to continue working with it and to yeah, keep yeah. promoting more of those animals out That's there. That's a great selling point, right? You can tell your wife that. Tell anybody. Make them accessible to the masses. Exactly. That's why we work with all this crazy, weird, less common stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, so... <laughs> <laughs> really? Is she smashing into the glass earlier? No, oh, I don't, not in front of me, but so he also has blackhead pythons, which I really, so here, really enjoy. I'm going to show you the male. She might be gravid, and she just, she's psycho. Okay. Um, she'll bash her face and knock herself out trying to grab you. But he's going to, come on, I know you think you're going to get food. Let's go. You're not getting food. It's really me. I mean, I guess. So this is my male blackhead. Um, mm -hmm. It's a little bit of a rough shed. We just sprayed it. Wisconsin in the winter, man. It's dry. You guys get yeah. it. Um, but uh, just a these. super cool snake. I've, these Womas and Dominican Red Mountain Boas were my, like, holy grail animals that I yeah. wanted at some point. And I've owned all of them on my list now. I mean, it's just been awesome to be able to keep these animals. And um, to be honest, I got to a point in my life where these guys weren't doing real great. I was traveling a lot. I had a relationship in the past that didn't work out and she wasn't taking care of the animals when she told me she was. Um, so these guys got real skinny and they weren't looking good. And honestly, actually having Erica in my life, she turned them all around. They're all doing yeah. great. I mean, so uh, a little bit about these guys too, that people see these and a lot of times you'll see them at shows and stuff and they'll be really big and chunky. That's not healthy for these ones. So some snakes are, are good to be, you know, chubbier and yeah. put on some weight. Uh, blackheads, if they get too fatty, they get uh, yeah, they get fatty, fatty liver, liver disease. They, they don't breathe. They well. don't breathe. Yeah, and even when they get fat, right, and then they you slim them down, they still won't breed because if they were fat at one point, like right. they have issues. So you have to keep them responsibly and keep them uh, in a manner that um, it keeps them healthy. You know. Well, and and the big thing is that is is understanding the biology of a lot of these different species. With with blackheads, these guys don't eat rodents and mammals in the wild they eat mm -hmm. reptiles so yeah, if they're eating a lot of lizards diets, yeah. yeah so it's all real lean there's not chunky fat stuff and the on top of even rodents the feeders we get in the hobby they're meant to grow and be big and fat well right. these animals don't handle fat well so the one thing i tell people too is if you're unsure keep them lean it's super easy to put weight on a reptile if you need to. Yeah. It's really hard to get it off. Yeah, absolutely. So all of our animals you'll see are generally going to be a little leaner yeah. than most. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. They're a lot leaner than most snake like animal people would keep their animals. Mm -hmm. But I know that if I need to put weight on him, I can up his feedings a little more. I can give him a little bit bigger meal, and he's going to yeah. gain weight real quick. Yeah. Oh yeah. Versus if he gets a little overweight, that's reducing his feeding to once a month of tiny meals and it's a year of doing that to get the same amount of weight off mm. that i can add in a month these things are so beautiful it's definitely a goal species of ours yeah for sure well she's got eggs you'll i'll let you know yeah oh no please and Do. these are so these guys are all from jason hood's swiss line so yeah we super we crisp and clean yeah, yeah, it's, yeah we look at them every time we go to 10 we're like hey jason <laughs> and we're like we just haven't pulled the trigger because if we get one, we really gotta get three. And yeah, like, yeah. And we don't want the ones that are like, oh, this one's like seven hundred bucks. Okay, no, we want the ones that are like fifteen hundred, yeah. two thousand dollars. Yeah, so that's that's where it's becoming was. a a thing. <laughs> Jason's like, these are my holdbacks I've had for two years, and I don't want to sell to anybody. And I'm like, but I want them. And he gave me the price, and I'm like, yeah. don't tell anybody what I paid for this. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. But so beautiful animal, man. They are. They're, they're just unique. They're cool. They're fun. Mm -hmm. um, and they're just pretty. Like, it's just such a unique, cool species. Oh, they're great. So these are the rain pythons we've got. These guys are actually really special. Um, these are the, this is the only male from this bloodline in the United States. This came from Heather McCallum in Scotland. Where are you at? Okay. I know you're gonna We have a uh, friend, Matthew Most, who does a lot of really cool animals and he has some ring pythons we're excited yeah. i love the rings they're awesome so oh, yeah. just insanely iridescent um oh, they're so gorgeous cool. snakes and i'm i'm a sucker for orange yeah so as babies these are like crap oh, yeah. yeah, oh yeah you know and then uh and this he's two and a half years old so these are another one that's not that big even the females even a, a, like a big females maybe about the size of that uh, dwarf super dwarf. I mean, yeah. they're big around, a little yeah. shorter, but they're not big snakes. They have real small heads for pythons. Yeah. So yeah. and they they're they're in they were in their own genus, but I think they put white lips in that genus now. Really? Um, I didn't know that. Yeah, Bothrachillus. Um, their 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 uh, species name is Boa. This is Bothrachillus Boa. 
<laughs> yeah, so, um, but just That's another beautiful super, super cool species that I've just always been enamored with. Um, and what's cool too is like Tom Keegan has a line of them that are high contrast. So a lot of them you see are real dark black and they turn into this just deep muddy brown. <laughs> and uh, and his lines, he bred them over the last 25 years. He's got mm -hmm. some that are like gold and just beautiful, beautiful animals. Um, and it's another one that used to be everywhere. I used to see them on, mm -hmm. li here you go, grab I used, yeah. or grab I used to see these on lists for, you know, 150 bucks. Yeah. Now you're lucky if you can find a pair for less than 1500. Yeah. But again, that's kind of we the will, ebb and flow of the hobby. So we will definitely be owning these at some point, probably, hopefully, fingers crossed by the end of this year, because, um, what? Because, uh, our friend Matthew Most is breeding them. Yeah. They're just so cool. It's a beautiful animal. Yeah. The one thing I would say is, is when I, and I was picky when I got them, I wanted really evenly banded ones. The aberrant ones as babies are super cool because they're just neon orange and all orange. Then as a, adults, they're all brown. So yeah, yeah. I like that contrast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What do you think, John? He's very cool. He loves them. I do. <laughs> and then we're growing up a little baby female over I here too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She just got out of her orange stage, so now she's kind of in that weird, like, ugly in teenager face. The, <laughs> the tweener. Yeah. You don't see many of them go for sale. No. No, nah, these guys are <laughs> scooped up real quick. It was it, just because, again, being that the only ones from Heather McCallum over it's her Scottish line, so that's the only mm. one in the U.S. from her. Um, I was like, yeah, I got to grab them. So then down here, I'm not going to pull them out because, you know, I know I'll get bit again. Um, but these are olive pythons, so liasis, olivation. So you notice we can do you, a lot of liasis. Can you open it and he can... Oh, yeah. That's the only thing that sucks about acrylic is the... All of this dust is actually from the humidifiers that we run. She actually might not be that bad. If you put, if you use the rest of the to get rid of the snakes, then she'll be fine. Yeah, if you smell like snakes, she'll eat you. She's coming. Hi. You, you, they won't be able to hear anything because the microphone's touching the bin, and when that happens, it's like. Well, one thing that's really unique, so I've had olive pythons multiple times over my you know, life, and they're always insanely aggressive. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not a joke how crazy they get. Yeah. Um, and I, I had a trio of them, and we got a, I talked to a friend, and we have a close friend of ours, actually, that we got the broadsides from, and he has this pair of olives. The female is this big around and 14 feet, wow. and she's a corn snake. It's the coldest, <laughs> friendliest snake I've ever been around. I'm like, dude, you, do you drug these things? I have them at home. They're not like that. Yeah. He's like, no, these are a northern locality, and all of the ones in captivity in the U.S. are central locality. And I talked to some guys over in Australia, and they're like, yeah, the, the northern ones get bigger, and they're not as crazy. So that's where these came from. And they're, again, not anybody has those. They have all the central crazy ones. Yeah. So I traded off my other group and got these. Um, the almost adult breeders for two little babies, but... She's pretty good. He's super food aggressive, liasis, food aggressive, cage aggressive. Sure. Um, but she, my daughters just pick her up and walk around and she's fine. Like we watch them because all of our snakes are a little twitchy. Yeah. But, um, so what do you got over here? Yeah. So these are our monitor cages. Um, and it was cool. So we worked with Leland at, you know, uh, Leland Ward to build all these and kind of design them. Yeah. Um, so our mod, so up here we have, I have to dig them all out, but, um, up here we've got peacock monitors. So our Varanus Offenbergi. I bet there's one in this too. Of course there is. It's like giving birth. There we go. Oh wow, very pretty. Yeah, so these are really gorgeous and peed all over me monitors. But this is why they're called peacock monitors. Darn. I don't know, good. Just because <laughs> of the just ridiculous colors on them. Um, but again, small, super small monitor, pretty wow. arboreal, um, similar to like a Timor but How they get way this? more color. This guy, a lot of them are wild caught, so mm -hmm. we don't know their exact age. This guy's probably about five or six. Really? Um, so they stay that size? Yeah, this is this is, big, this is a big, nice, big male. Wow. wow. So the female that took off in there while I was trying to get him out, she's a lot smaller. Um, that is beautiful. But yeah, these are just incredible monitors. And recently they started doing a population study on Roddy, Roddy Island. Mm -hmm. So they shut down export of any wild caught ones. They're only releasing, they're allowing certain farms in Indonesia to hold permits to breed them mm -hmm. and release the captive bred babies. So now it's just getting even harder to get them. Wow. Um, so we're trying to, this has been a goal of ours to, of me and Erica's to try and build a breeding program with these. Mm -hmm. So most of the babies we get for the first couple of years, a decent amount of them will be held back to keep growing a good population from those groups. Have these been produced in captivity yet? 
Yeah, here and there. Um, they're not super difficult to breed, but they're not... A lot of the species we're used to... Crap all over me. A lot of the species <laughs> we're used to are species that, like, go through a cool down and you hibernate them or you do something to stimulate them. Mm. A lot of the species out here that we work with are out of these islands and areas in the South Pacific that don't fluctuate temperature and rainfall that much. Some of them do, depending on where they're at, but it's not that much. It mm -hmm. may, I mean, like Solomon Islands, you're 78 to 85 year round. And then, you know, every month is the rainy season, except September, which has a half inch less rain. Like, so yeah. it's really steady constantly. And there's other things that cause it, like uh, the super dwarfs, a lot of the islands they're from, uh, birds migrating through. Mm -hmm. That's what oh. stimulates their breeding because sure. they eat a whole bunch of food really quick. Mm -hmm. So we switch up food with these guys. We switch up their habitat. We keep them pretty mm -hmm. humid. We'll ro we'll go fish to rodents. We are not ro not too many rodents with these. They're mostly insectivores. But we'll do different insects. We do a little bit of fish here and there, um, just to kind of stimulate different things that might be happening and see if it makes a difference. And mm -hmm. Erica's really good at de cataloging all the different things we do. So if we start to see successes in some of them, then we'll kind of see okay what caused it. What time of year was it was there any mm. environmental parameters that happen um, a lot of these species we throw together when storms come through mm. just because that pressure change will spike their interest sure um, but all the peacocks they kind of sit together in groups so um, he actually hasn't been with us too long I was pretty sure males are the ones that have all the color so mm. I was pretty sure I had 4.2 then we actually sexed him I had 2.4 so that was it was <laughs> thought that the color was a thing but it's not really sexually dimorphic it's dependent some yeah. feet like even shinosaurus are like that you find females that are red like a male yeah, yeah, yeah. so it, yeah. after i was like two weeks ago we realized that and i'm like screw it i'm done even trying like they all look the same they all doesn't color doesn't matter there's nothing um but we found a way to get them to avert their hemipenes um so we have a little bit more accurate way of telling what's what but yeah yeah so you guys know katie carl Hello. yeah of course so we ha have you seen the peacock monitor print she has I don't know if I've seen that one. I've seen a lot of her stuff. I, we, I bought the, I paid her to paint it for Erica. So it's mm. in our bedroom. And then we told her to make money for her conservation. She should do yeah. prints of it. But we have the original in the room. That's so cool. Uh, wow. Giant butterfly agamas. Wow. Oh, well, he's speechless. Yeah, he can hold him. He's gonna, he's squirrely. He's gonna run. All right. So what's crazy with these guys is they, they, no one is breeding them in captivity. They farm them for food in Vietnam. Like it's not hard to breed them, but we're, mm. we're picked. Everybody's trying to treat them like some tropical animal because it comes from Vietnam. It must come from the rainforest. Mm -hmm. These guys come from the desert. There's a desert in Vietnam. Um, and we actually looked at the, the farm, the farming management guides that were out there on how they were farming them. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're looking at to reproduce them in captivity. But wow. like a lot of people that get these are feeding them lots of insects, they're herbivores. So that, oh. was, that was one thing with these guys we were worried about because of my friend that had them was doing insects because that's what everybody does. That's the information out sure. there. And we're like, crap, now we've got to get them from a high protein diet to a lower protein herbivore diet without shocking their kidneys and stuff. Luckily I have Erica who's a med reptile medical genius and can handle understanding how to do that um, and supplementing them properly to get their body back. But even seeing pictures from when I got him to now, like two months ago, kind of, well, not even that, just he was more drab, wasn't as colorful, and now he's, I mean, this is him sleeping. This is him fired down. Like, he's vibrant it's and gorgeous. colorful. He's unbelievable. Just the striping is ridiculous. Yeah, and so what they do, why they call them butterfly gammas, is when they get, like, they freak out in the wild or they get a predator, they flatten the rib cage oh, way out right. and they spread out into a huge disc, and those all those feel, colors come out. You feel his ribs popping? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's crazy. So Hold him run through him a little bit. I'm trying. <laughs> oh, he'll, no, he'll no, he's off. like really fast. Right? Yeah. No, I understand that, but <laughs> this is like trying to hold on to a giant collared lizard that doesn't want to be held. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. At least when they hit the floor, that's why we have hardwood because they <laughs> just they burn out and they can't run away. Makes <laughs> sense. So cool. Yeah. So these guys are just one that's kind of fun for us. And and are they easy to get in the United States? They're not hard they come in every like five or six years pretty re, re, like re, like they come in i don't know maybe i want to say they're uncommon or rare but they're not common um and they only come in once in a while and when they do they come in a lot and then they're done and then you don't see them for a while um so this last shipment i think honestly i think we're getting them though some of these importers are getting them from those farms yeah. because the consumption 
in Asia of these guys has gone down dramatically. So those farms, I think, are selling them into the pet trades around the world to make up for that difference, mm -hmm. um, which is super cool. Like, this is way cooler than half the lizards here. So yeah. I'm totally cool with it, but... Um, it looks like a tasty dactyl. Right? I mean, like, I guess you could <laughs> eat this, but, like, you can feel the tail. It's all yeah, I know, it's bone. All, yeah. Like, that would be the most horrifically really annoying weird. thing to eat. Yeah. But it felt really weird when I was holding him, like, when he just, as you were saying that, he was, like, trying to get out, and I can feel him starting to try to flex yeah. his ribs out. It's crazy. But just a super cool lizard. And then the female is just brown and unimpressive. Come here, you. <laughs> but yeah, so, and she's going through shit, but that's the girl. So oh, yeah, just, yeah. Woo, come here. Simmer. And then there's, like, a lot of iguanids. <laughs> they build up salt in their body and they shoot it out through their nostrils. So if you have these as pets, uh, the front of your glass is going to be covered in salt boogers. And that's what their, his whole face, why it was white like that. That's all salty boogers. So it makes it a lot more fun to clean up after him. Here, so we'll just show her to you this way because then I'm going to get less bit and peed on. Um, this is Varana spinulosis. Uh, these are uh, spiny neck mangrove monitors from the Solomon Islands. Another one that like not a ton of people are working with, but there's probably us and maybe two other people we know that are actively trying to breed them. Um, there's never been captive success in the US. They've been hatched from wild imports that were pregnant, gravid. Um, and then Quetzal Dwyer in Costa Rica at his zoo actually hatched one, but he's like, I have no idea what I did. They just did it on their own and hatched one. <laughs> so so trying to mimic these guys in their, their habitat's not easy. Um, but uh, who is it in Montana? Charlie, Charlie Birch, and uh, I think he's in Montana, um, is, uh, has gotten a couple eggs and he's had a little bit of success. I spooked you with a full belly of water and made you get all goobery. Yeah, well, that's also she had, but it was her pinky knife. Oh, yeah. Just, so, so, but most of these guys are insectivore too. Um, and we'll, we'll do, they're squirrely. Um, but we'll do uh, mostly ro roaches. We'll do pinkies and stuff like that once in a while. Do fish. Yeah. Um, I'll clams and things like that. I look, one of my favorite things to do and every reptile keeper should do, go to your nearest Asian market, like really Asian market, yeah. and go down the freezer section. I get frog legs, I get earthworm, I get pupa, silkworm pupa, I get huge locusts, you can get clams, legs. quail. Do you think we could do frog legs with the uh, pygmy pythons? No. They're, they're bullfrog legs, man. But like yeah, your, but your dry markon would go nuts for frog oh, I'm legs. Oh, sure. You know, and they're and they're leaner. I mean, and this is all human grade stuff, so it's yeah. treated like the snails are going to be better than anything we can catch or get. Yeah, I've got to worry about all the, the parasites and stuff. We um we have the pygmy pythons, and when they come out, they're, they're like teeny. you know this long and about this wide, and they don't eat because in the wild they eat not dog geckos. We're not paying three hundred dollars a meal, <laughs> you know, like it's just not going to happen. So you got to force feed them like a pinky, a mouse pinky leg. Yeah, like that's and it's. Ryan's, you know, pro at it, and it's tough, but it's it's a hard deal to do. So, so the last couple, these are a couple of the racks I have, as I said, I don't really do much, but these are baby grow-outs. Um, so these are a pair of Maclots pythons, little babies. They're psychos, and they like to bite you too. See, she's he's, she's already going. She's ready to bite me. Um, and this is how they are as babies. They generally, I'd like to tell you, yep, see, I'd like to tell you they calm down, but then I did something earlier that you have video of that shows that I'm lying. Um, <laughs> but generally they do. They just, she's, she's, it's kind of funny. They go through the stage where they're babies. They grow up and they hit like three and a half feet and a switch just shuts off and they stop being aggressive and they're way calmer, just out of nowhere. Um, they're kind of in that in-between mode, mm -hmm. but, and then these guys are cool. These are also Maclots, but these are uh, locality specific. So these are t uh, Timor Island Maclots. So those are captive bred in the, uh, in the US by Fascination Herp out of Texas. And then these guys, what's in here? This is a Woma, actually this is one of the, a Woma from that one over there, of course it's in Shed. Um, but I've been trying to breed that female for a long time and I, I've had a couple successes, um, but I lost the eggs in the incubator die when I was out of town for the weekend. The next time she slugged out. And, um, but what I wanted, what I wanted her is if you, you look at her, she's super contrasted for an adult. They don't mm -hmm. look that clean. She yeah. looks like a baby. So I wanted to get really high bands, really high contrast, um, and I wanted to get a, a baby from her mm -hmm. and hopefully breed it back and see if I can continue the, that line of high contrast. Right. She doesn't get, yeah. Well, it's funny, Womas too, so here. Right, just look at this. Womas, when they're gonna bite, you know, because they crack their mouth. 
before they strike, they crack their mouth. So he's in strike mode, and you can tell because they open their mouth and they sit there like that. Not even the insane he thinks he's a huge rattlesnake thing he's doing. Just the mouth. Nice pose, buddy. That's so funny. But yeah. Ooh. They're just like, I want to get my mouth half open so it's less work to bite you. Yeah, there you go. And then lastly up here, we've got some little grow out white lip pythons. Oh Ooh, my gosh. White lips. Yeah, so come here. They're these babies. guys actually, these guys aren't too bad. But just little babies. Beautiful. Let's see if I can get in on that head. I got a, we got like six more, so if this one doesn't want to, we got more options. Nice. There we go. But it's got a nice golden hue. Yeah, so these are the no, get, these are all northerns. And they all get super iridescent, which is beautiful. Yeah, just ridiculously iridescent. I'm trying to find, I'm growing these babies out because I want to find high contrast gold ones. I found pictures online of some over in Indo that were, I mean, the goldest you've ever seen on one, their whole body up to their head and their hmm. head was black. But that's what I want. I want craziest goldest ones I can find so mm. I'm picking up babies here and there and growing them up to see what they turn into Erica likes the dark ones so we'll probably take one group of each and yeah, go each way with it yeah. go lighter and darker mm. so is that locality specific with the gold I don't the, the, so the, the, loca the, the gold is the northerns is one species and the black ones that you see that are out there are southerns another species um, this northern and southern Papua New Guinea um, and then it could be locality it could be something genetic that happens yeah. where they're gold like that I'm not sure um, unfortunately, a lot of time when those guys are collecting over in Indonesia, it's not like they don't give you GPS coordinates where they found it. So yeah. you don't even know what island they came from. So yeah. it's kind of just a, they, you brought in 40 of them. Let me see what 40 you have. Send me the three goldest ones you have and hopefully we get something out of it. Um, and then this is another white, this is a captive bread bale. So he's pretty cool. I just got him in this week, traded with somebody. So, oh, I know you're spazzy, but you're actually not that bad. So yeah, you can hold on. He's, tw he's twitchy, but he hasn't, he hasn't tried to strike or anything. He's like, you took me out of my home. But these guys are just the iridescence, the contrast on their head, the white in their face, like just a super, <laughs> super cool snake. He's like sticking to my arm. And they're known for being psychos, which yeah, like one of the wild caught females I have is, she's crazy, mm -hmm. um, but yes. they calm down pretty relatively easy. Yeah. Wild caught stuff. Like, yeah. Right. And these guys are just a lot of arboreal snakes you find too, especially when they're wild caught. They're defensive. I mean, they live in a tree in the open. They have to be aggressive. Blood. Wild caught bloods. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. That's how you concentrate just anger in a <laughs> sack. <laughs> <laughs> these things are beautiful. Yeah. Here he comes. Phew. So these guys are already going through their color change, but you can see how like that dark starting to come in and that orange is real pale. As babies, the orange is the same color as this. Like it's neon orange. And then their eyes start or orange and start to turn white. You can kind of see they're in that like halfway phase. Mm -hmm. But you still see the orange around the, around the pupil and around the edges. And that's what caught me with them, man. Like one, it, again, it was the orange thing. So like when I went to get my first, like, this was my first exotic snake I ever kept. Yeah. But like, so in here, there's a little uh, Gonatodes vitatus, a little striped gecko. Um, and then these guys are super cool. These are uh, uh, cool. Eurodactylodes vialardi. So yeah, these yeah. are, so what's cool, and I don't know if a lot of people know this, they shoot ooze out of their tail into your eyeballs. <laughs> so have you ever seen Stro the video of the Strophurus gecko in Australia oh, squirting yeah. ooze out of its tail? Yeah. These do that too. Nice. I've never seen one or heard of one doing it, do it in captivity, but they can. But when they come so, out of the egg as babies, they arch up like cats and they're right away ready to just shoot you. That's so cool. And it's, so you keep care for these is similar to like all the New Caledonian stuff, crested gecko diet. Yeah, and it crickets. looks, yeah. But they're like, the way they walk, they're like little robots. Like they're super robotic and calculated. And their grip mm. is crazy. If you don't know if you want, that's crazy. They have teeny tiny little hands and just like mm. a super strong grip. Oh yeah. <laughs> these are really cool so how old is this one that one uh, I got from Katie Bugler at the beginning of last year so they're about a year a little over wow. a year um, and we got we ended up with two girls so Tenley this weekend is part of the goal might be to see if I can scrounge up a little boyfriend for him that's so cool and how long like how old do they have to be to breed I mean I grow everything slow mm -hmm. I wait till about three years most stuff can probably breed like these guys can probably breed at two two and a half Okay. I like to wait till three or three and a half. 
Um, just because one thing, you know, especially, and this is something else that we all get stuck in this, they have to weigh this much to breed. Yeah. Well, you can get an animal to any weight you want as fast as you want it. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't mean that their endocrine system and their, their it doesn't mean that their hormones have actually caught up. So yeah. they may be mature size, but their organs and their it may not be sexually mature. Mm -hmm. So I'd rather wait longer and then maybe it's an extra year that sucks. That's an extra year you can't produce, but then your eggs, you get better production, you get better quality eggs, you get bigger clutches, and it's mm -hmm. not as stressful on their body where you're not risking, you know, egg binding and potentially hurting them where their lifespan shortens. Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> things are cute. They're, they're super cool. And they're just, they're pretty diurnal, so they just kind of hang. They come out, you know, they're crepuscular, so they come out during the, at night and, or the uh, dusk and dawn, but. Yeah. <laughs> they're cool. <laughs> they're just a rabbit. Yeah, man. Um, I used to, when I bred all those geckos, one of my favorite geckos to keep and breed was Chihua. Oh yeah, we like Chihuahuas. So these are mainland Chihuahuas from my male that I hatched out. Um, they look so cool. Yeah, I like them. their heads. But like he had, the, the, my male hatched out they in jump. 2010. They like um, run off. Right? Well, and what's, so, and he, and he's, he fires up black, like yeah. black, black. So I f waited forever to find a female for him that was like that. I tried a couple females. It didn't really, he didn't, they didn't seem to pair up or the babies didn't work mm -hmm. what I wanted. And then this last time I found a perfect female. Well, she ended up having massive um, issues and she, like Chihuahuas will crash when they breed, they calcium crash. Yeah, yeah, So right, you gotta exactly. add a lot more calcium. Yeah. And she was doing that and I'm like, this is normal. Just keep, just catch them, right? Just put, keep, keep putting calcium in the food. It's not a mm -hmm. big deal. Oh, no. And then I went in there one day and she was t contorted and totally trashed. Oh yeah. Um, so I brought her home and Erica took a look at her and ended up being massive uh, liver issues, kidney issues, reproductive issues. It was genetic that like, so that's why she, that happened to her. She wasn't absorbing her calcium anyway, uh, but she was gravid. So we ended up um, having her put down. And uh, when they did that, we cut the eggs out. And then I incubated them and they both hatched. Oh, it's super cool. That's crazy. So this is like, this is the only chance I got to grow up babies from that female and hopefully produce more really dark black baby chihuahua. These are so cool. We, um, we were up, when we went up to Canada, we hung out and actually we were like the first one, the video, Mark Orfus's uh, place yeah. in um, Northern Gecko. Oh, yeah. And I, <laughs> every time that they jump, I'm always like, all right, at least Chihuahuas, they either run off or they jump at something they think they can get a hold of. Right, versus we're, just flopping and yeah, putting yeah, their arms we're, out. We're yeah. like, uh, um, Crested's are like, <laughs> and they're like, just go. So another cool thing with these guys, especially when they're babies, yeah. to avoid predators, they jump, grab their butt, and curl their tail around their nose, and roll into the leaf litter so they look like a little nut. Yeah. Their dad, the day he hatched, I pulled, I was set the, the, the container on the table and opened it up, and he ran across the table, jumped up a little bit, curled himself up, rolled off the table, fell on the floor, and just sat there. And just, <laughs> just laid there looking like a little nut. That's so cool. But yeah, these are uh, easily my favorite of the New Caledonian species. They they get bigger, but they're not as grumpy as leeches. They're more interactive than a lot of the other ones. Yeah. I think that they're a good size. Like when they get when like as adults, you know, like it's just like really yeah. perfect. You, you they can handle the cool it, but feed. it's not they're huge. Like, yeah. yeah, they can um, be flighty if you're not handling them a lot, and they'll run and jump and stuff like that. Yeah. But they can also be pretty chill. So and I, it's I really nice like that it. they regrow their tail. So <laughs> like, yeah. Um, and then the, up here is a little Sarah Snorum. I'm not sure. Oh, there she is. So this was a gift to Erica from Bill. This is the first Sarah Snorum he ever hatched. So. Oh, that's beautiful. It's just they're it's just cute. cool, and they're they're another one that's more personality than a crusty. They get a little bit bigger. They're just a little bit. They're just different. They're yeah. not the same thing, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, and they're just they're they're not. You look at the crazy colors and stuff, but that like that tan brown in there is real creamy and cool yeah, looking. Yeah. And, Got a little Rex. Oh, uh, it's gonna jump out of my hands. Hopefully. It might. Right into your beard. And you're not That's right. Back. So all of those species, a lot of those new Caledonian species, all have like super hyper elastic tendons. Yeah. So that they can take jumps like that and hit the ground and not hurt themselves. Oh yeah, and they do. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> like that is their goal. They're just like, hey, have you crapped yourself today? Yeah. Just wait. Yeah. <laughs> These are all made by Zilla and everything in here is a Zilla product. Ooh, Zilla? <laughs> Zilla sounds great. <laughs> Zilla, this is cool. That, that actually, this video has been brought to you by Zilla. <laughs> so these, oh, before I get them out, you can take a look. So these are Gastrophilus persina. Oh yeah, I've seen these 
I've seen these on Facebook when you've posted pictures. Yeah. yeah. It's so green. They're like a tiny little super way smarter the green tree monitor. Let me see if I can get them to do their defense. That's their defense. Whoa. Hold on. Uh, uh, I ruined it. I'm sorry. All good. No, but like, it's just funny to me. Their defense is, let me show you my fruit roll up tongue and flop it at you. Like, it's not even. Never seen something so spazzy in my life. <laughs> yeah, they're twitchy. <laughs> but and they're also egg glures. So the first eggs we hatched at the lab, we've got them here again. They're both right here. Oh, there it goes. You gonna do it? You gonna be mad? Come here, be mad. You're making a little like. Noise. Oh, that's the that's the, that's the baby croc. <laughs> yep, there it goes. He's gonna. Yeah, but so these guys are egg lures, and the first time they laid eggs in the lab, they glued them to the inside of one of these. And I was at a show, and Bill called me. He's like, "Uh, what do I do?" And I'm like, <laughs> "Peel them off. Just be real careful." He's so, so he's like on the phone with me. He's like, "All right, I'm doing it." And then I hear a move and he's like, no, no, I'm not doing it. I'm gonna break them. I can't do this. It's too much stress. I can't do it. You gotta be here. And I'm like, Billy, you gotta do something with the eggs. And he's like, all right, I got it. Never mind. You'll see when you get back. I got back, the incubator's in my office. The whole rock hide was in the incubator. <laughs> it's just like, I can't get them out. Problem solved. That's I mean, right. He's, he's a <laughs> yeah, so yeah. I'm like, yeah, I'm like I, yeah, I can't really give you crap for that, but it's pretty funny. <laughs> so then these guys are ones we got recently that you don't see too much anymore either. These are uh, giant Madagascar velvet geckos, Blazodactylus boivinii. Um, oh, I just to, see those ever. Yeah, they, they used to come in like 10 years ago. I used to see them pretty off, like pretty regularly, oh, but that was back when you also, I also bought leaf tails for 30 bucks, <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> you know? Um, and now that you just don't see them. So these popped up and this was one that I always wanted. And I was like, Erica, these are kind of neat. Have you ever seen these? Look how neat these are. Wouldn't they be yeah. neat to have? Do you like them? Oh, you love them? You want them right now? <laughs> I guess. <laughs> I guess we'll get them. So this is probably one of the most special animals that we have. Um, this was a gift from a good friend. Um, and you can hear him, he's talking because he hears us. Come here, Sobek. Come on. Come here. No, come on. He's just gonna bark at me. He listens to her way better. Oh yeah, and you're gonna, he won't bite her, but he'll bite me. Here. So this he does his mama. is a baby West or a baby African dwarf crocodile. So there's only, I believe, as far as I'm aware, there's only three people in the U.S. producing these, and because they're on the Endangered Species Act, you have to have a CBW permit to buy them or sell them. Well, with the newest person taking over uh, the Department of the Interior, they stopped giving out CBW permits to private citizens. So you can't get a permit now. So you can't get them. So the only way to get one is if one of those three people gives it to you as a gift mm. and ha sends you paperwork with it that's a gift. So this was uh, just something that was given to us just because crocod crocodilians are something that are super like important to me and Erica and we really have a huge passion for crocodilians. Um, and this is kind of a dream species for us. So we work with a lot of crocodilian research and conservation initiatives and sponsor a lot of it. And uh, just as a thank you, one of the guys that had these gave uh, gave this to us as a gift. Can we uh, get that in the light a little better? Cause I really yeah. want to show it to people. Oh, wow. there you go. But yeah, these guys are just super neat. And it's a tiny, tiny crocodile. I mean, I want to say snout vent, they only get like two and a half feet. That hits him. No, yeah. Two and a half is snout vent. I mean, they only get like five, maybe. Yeah. It's cute. But he is that bloated after only eight crickets. Yeah, <laughs> he's he's a chunky little eater, man. Like he, he he'll eat until he looks like a little egg, like he's got egg belly, and then he just kind of floats around. He, every time he hears the girls, he he chirps. So when the when the the kids are running through here, he'll start meow, 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 and chirping at them. We, we love crocodilians. I think they're great. It, we just can't really keep them in Jersey. So well, and that's something else too that tough. you kind of have to think about. Like I just I dealt with three people this week that had little baby gators that are super adorable, and I'm like, can you take care of a 14 foot thousand pound one? And they're like, no. But it's a baby now, and I'm like, yeah, but it's not going to stay that way unless you yeah. seriously neglect it. Yeah. You know. So while we have some crocodilian species. We also only have small ones. We have the area and the facilities to be able to build large enclosures. We're very knowledgeable in crocodile. Half of our library is crocodilian books. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, we're probably going to be set. Erica's looking at going down to the uh, croc school, the a AZA croc school this year. Oh, cool. Um, just, just to go get some experience and do it. And we know a lot of the guys that run it. So 
um, just to kind of get down there and just see how these zoos deal with crocs, any kind of enrichment things they do. She's already point training them all and clicker training them. Um, if she takes him out, he comes out to her and like walks up into her hand, mm. like on command. It's and then I tried doing it and he bit my finger. <laughs> so it's a voice thing. <laughs> I don't sound as adorable as she does um, and inviting. I guess I'm more the dad voice. So yeah, that's probably a good thing, right? But uh, <laughs> but no, it's super cool to watch these guys like touch a target to get food and then wait for a command. And yeah, especially when they're, they're tiny, tiny little babies. This the intelligence on them is just unreal. Now these guys are just something else, and there's a lot of cool studies being done with them too. And um, you know, they definitely support croc conservation. So uh, anybody that ever can donate to Croc Fest, Croc Fest, Croc I need Croc Fest. They're all over the country, and all that goes to crocodile conservation. This last year, it all went to the acutest of the American crocodile. Mm -hmm. um, uh, St. Augustine does a lot of it. Rob yeah. Discovery Center does like a Croc yeah. Fest, or you know, in October, San Diego Zoo does does one. A lot of zoos do them, and it's a lot of cool opportunities to raise money for saving these guys. So cool. Hey, that's the actual pretty face. Yeah. Right. Um, but then another big part of it too is like it's cool to be able to try and breed a lot of these species. But we're also doing stuff like we have a digital micrometer that Erica uses to measure the widths of their long or lengths of their long bones, their skulls, and we track all that because coming from the veterinary side, the one thing she was like, she said it. She's like, look, if you brought this to a vet, even a good reptile vet, there's no data on them. Yeah. Uh, spinulosis versus a, a, a you know water monitor or savanna like there's nothing for the vet to compare them to or to have that body of knowledge so we're also mm -hmm. trying to track growth rates with babies um, some of our babies are going to that we're growing up that were import babies are going to go to the discovery center for them to work with and train their employees how to, to grow monitors and That's do training so awesome. and mm -hmm. once they're older then we'll swap them out for new babies because we're always we're trying to bring in them pretty often to try and continue to build a good group of them so because mm -hmm. you know, anything wild caught it, it takes three to four years to get them stable yeah. to where they're comfortable to try and breed so it's a long-term project and we kind of constantly want to be bringing in new blood if, if a male doesn't work out so we have something as a backup then we aren't pulling in fresh wild caught where there's another four years before he's going to do anything so we're kind of doing that and we worked with the discovery center to talk to rob about like why don't we use this as an opportunity for you guys to educate your 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 uh, interns staff, yeah. and staff about how to work with these smart monitors grow up some babies and how to clicker train them and do the stuff we're doing a structured program right. and, and then we'll once they get a little older then we'll rotate them out and give you new babies to work with and then just kind of and then they can also have really cool species that like really no other zoo's showing yeah um and they can kind of have a fresh rotation of them that's great and uh so you've shown us your collection of your private stuff and so uh, to be honest a couple of things reasons why we wanted to come hang out with you aside from being able to see all the cool animals and stuff like that it's obviously we like each other yeah you know, well i mean i like you you know yeah, and so, yeah, <laughs> so we've been friends for a while and, yeah. and uh, i appreciate you letting us come but also the way that you do things and and the care that you have not just for you know hey i want to keep this information to myself but you are like one of the the top people in the hobby and in the, in the industry that help disseminate like real solid good knowledge and you are actively trying to collect that to distribute you know i mean you're yeah. you have the herpetological society it's probably the biggest in the country really it's and most active it's sure. most active yeah, yeah. and yeah. um you're you're constantly like trying to educate people but not just not just like, hey, I want to show you this so that I can sell it to you, or I want to show you this so because it's better for the animal. But you're actually also trying to build a knowledge base so that other people out in anywhere, even people you don't know, you haven't met, you're right. putting it out there so that people can actually say, oh, we know how to keep this. So then the conservation, the conservation is going to increase just because of you're disseminating real information, right. and it's not just information you're like, well, I heard this guy in Australia tell me this, and so we think it's right. You know, it's stuff that you're like, oh, I'm going to test it. I'm yeah. going to, I'm going to, I'm going to track this. And that's one of the reasons we wanted to get you on camera and we wanted to see your stuff. And, you know, we're going to showcase, you know, some other parts of your business as well. And, um, you know, with the friends of scales. And, I like uh, how you're like, showcase other parts of your business. You know, this. This. <laughs> this. <laughs> right here. So, yeah. but, uh, so we wanted to do this because you have awesome stuff and we'd like to show awesome stuff. But also we want to get people to know who you are and know about the, the stuff. Because there's a lot of people that watch our YouTuber that watch, you know, stuff and they're like, oh man, these are cool animals. 
but they may not get the broader picture yeah. of like, well, some of these are super rare and they're rare because people don't know how to keep them. Well, and that's, this. so that happens so much. And like, I, the biggest thing that kills me is when people come up at a show and they're like, hey, do you have a care sheet for this? And I'm like, you just picked up a thing you can't pronounce. Yeah. And you want me to hand you a one page care sheet. And care sheets are great as a starting point, as a yeah. first step on a long ladder. Yeah. It's, it's, this is the bare minimum to not kill this. <laughs> yeah. That's what a care sheet is. The bare yeah. minimum you need for this to not die in a week. Yeah. But after that, you need to study and do more research. And for me, the educational part of getting that information out, and someday I'm not going to be alive anymore. Yeah. And when I, I don't want to be one of those guys where I pass away and all of my knowledge and experience that I've built up goes with me. Yeah. Because then how, how, that's not helping the hobby, that's not helping the animals, that's not helping the community. I want every little kid to turn into a total reptile nerd like me, and they need that drive and focus and wit, like better information. And there's just so much bad information out there. It's all, you know... People gotta want want more. They gotta yeah. want more. Like these closures are great, and I'm happy with them for the space we have now. This is nowhere near close to the end of where I want to go. Yeah. Like a pole barn with zoological enclosures for every animal <laughs> is where I want to end up. Yeah. You know, but and is that realistic for everybody? No. But if, for what we're doing, that's what I want, and that's yeah. you know, like we're even talking about. We didn't get to, we got married, and we're like we'll plan a honeymoon later. We're talking about this later this year, possibly early next year, going to the Solomon Islands to go study uh, 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 spinulosis in the wild. Go yeah. sit. All I want to do is sit out in the woods, on the ground for half a day and just observe and watch them. Like, mm. what kind of animals are running around? What are they eating? Where are they spending most of their time? Uh, are they? Am I finding them in burrows and under stuff or arboreal? Like everybody thinks they're tree monitors. Ketzel did a, a an observationist naturalist type write up on them. Mm. They're not. They're terrestrial just they run up trees to hide and they have insanely good eyesight so by the time you find them they saw you 20 minutes ago and they're up the tree hiding yeah so mm -hmm. they never saw them out of trees so they mm -hmm. assumed that they're arboreal well then i got them and we put them in an arboreal enclosure all they did was burrow the whole time and screw the whole cage up and and then they just go up to bask and come right down and sleep on the ground again so i, I it, so we started talking about it and then we found that paper and i'm like i think they're arboreal for hunting and for food but they're really just and or for for getting away for you know trying to escape so otherwise they're, they're terrestrial the food. Mm -hmm. and then if yeah if you give them a lot of terrestrial food they don't climb at all so wow. then we went to these horizontal longer enclosures and now they burrow and they hide and they dig and they do way more and they're more active um mm -hmm. and but that's something that it took like nobody knew yeah mm -hmm. and it took a lot of tweaking for us to like figure it out yeah, their muscle definition is much better because they're using more of their habitat. They're, they, they just, everything is better. And, and even moving the snakes from like the racks and stuff into these style cages mm -hmm. and giving them more height, like ours are all 18 inches. I wanted to do 24, but, but we had to get so many cages in there. So we yeah, yeah. sacrificed one 18. But like the, the Superdorf Retic, he is up. They're arboreal. They are up all yeah, the yeah. time. I mean, mainlands, mainlands are semi-arboreal. Super dwarfs are arboreal snakes. Some of the islands they live on, it's basically a swamp, like a mangrove marsh, mm -hmm. that when the tide goes down, there's land. And mm -hmm. when the tide comes up, it's trees coming out of the ocean. So like, they never touch the ground, you mm -hmm. know? So we create an enclosure to kind of test that. And we're talking with Garrett about different things that we could do, and he's gonna do to try and see like, how does that change their behavior? Mm -hmm. um, I did a lot of years of playing with UV and light, lights and reptiles. Mm -hmm. And like this idea that they don't need it is just complete crap. Like mm. all, all living things use UVB and AVA, and everything does. There's, I mean, ball pythons are actually one of the few things that we're studying that don't use UVB. They still use UVA though, and yeah. UVA is something that just people don't understand or even know. Um, mm. I saw an article recently that said that UVA was a marketing gimmick, and that killed me inside because there's scientific articles from the 40s that show how UVA affects reptiles and their uh, natural instincts and behaviors. Mm. And we're ignoring a hundred, you know, eighty years of research because they don't really want to pay twenty more dollars for a bulb. Yeah, they don't need to survive. But I'm like, I'm not trying to let. I'm not. I don't have these so they can survive. I want them to grow. I want them to breed. I want them to. I want to observe them. I want to see mm -hmm. how they react with their environment and just hmm. enjoy them more. Yeah. So, and there's things you can think about, like leashes. They they live in in tree hollows and they yeah. live in there. They do go out and wander, but so you can adjust. Like some, a lot of the monitor habitats we have, that's all cork tubes because I know yep. they want to be in a little cork tube. Yep. I also know they're going to get out and squirrel around and run around and, and exactly, explore. Exactly, right. So how can you recreate all of those different micro habitats and microclimates? And that's the biggest thing. Everybody should read the definition of a microclimate. 
Because when you hear desert species, everybody goes, oh, it's from the desert? That looks like dunes in the Sahara. All deserts are dunes in the Sahara. <laughs> and all tropical species come from the rainforest. Yeah. The rainforest, not the a rainforest, one. the only one. Yeah. You know, but they're all different. And there's all these microclimates, like, look at dart frogs in the Amazon. A foot off the ground, it's 72 degrees. Up here, it's 98 and 100% humidity. You yeah. Know, it's just, there's a massive change in temperature in every foot you go off the ground. So there's all these microclimates and small, hat, like different humidity levels that these animals can find. And then we put them in an enclosure that it's all 60% humidity. It's all this, it's all that. And you're, you're not recognizing these microhabitats. And that's something with like a lot of the Australian dwarf monitors, it's mm -hmm. a huge issue. Cause people see them, oh, they're from the desert and they live on these cliffs and they mm -hmm. do, but these crevices that go back in these cliffs go back 50 yards and they're full of moisture and humidity and insects and they're really packed and mm -hmm. so they, it's cooler, it's not as hot, it's really humid. Then we keep them in captivity, we keep them 150 degree basking spot and treat it like a desert. They all have kidney failure and gout and they, they, they die early and they don't do well and that's because we're looking at their habitat from 100 yards away or from, from a mile away, not the specific area they really use within that habitat. Yeah, that's great information. I mean, <laughs> You can sit here and talk about it. I like <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, like it. <laughs> so, thank you so much for having us over yeah. and uh, for showing us all your awesome animals. We're going to do another video with you, so you guys got to make sure you check on our next video with Ryan McVeigh and Erica McVeigh and um, show you some other pieces of what they do. And make sure you guys like our videos and subscribe if you haven't already. Hit that notification bell so that you know when we post new stuff, you see it. And uh, comment below, let us know what you thought of this collection and what your favorite piece was. Um, did you really enjoy seeing Ryan get bit up? <laughs> <laughs> it did happen. It did happen. Yeah, it did nothing happen. Yeah, you'll have to see it on the bloopers. After <laughs> so, all right, thank you guys so much and uh, stay classy. Cool. Take care. Trick Garrett did. Oh, yeah, get a snake to let go of you. Watch it. That looks disgusting. You're not gonna do it either. It usually works. <laughs> oh, okay. So you got that on recording. Oh, wow. Garrett did that with a retic. And it usually works. Yeah. Uh, oh, I know. Take. With a retic? <laughs> like, oh, you painted a whole wall. Gosh, you're an ass. I knew that would happen too. But, so lyases as a genus are super cage defensive. But when they get out, they're puppies. Yeah, I'm not food. Are you done yet? Is there anything I can do to help you? You want me to spray with water? Yes, I suck for you. You're not gonna like it. <laughs> How's that feel? Hands all covered in <gasps> nothing. <laughs> yeah, dude, Lias, not you're good. She's just gonna once she gets enough of a mouthful of hand sanitizer, she'll let go. Ooh, that was your tooth. You done yet? Yeah, that sucks. Done that? You could let go. It'd suck less. <laughs> there, better, idiot. Oh, she's super sweet. You can no, I didn't say she was super sweet. I said she was bipolar and an idiot. <laughs> she's still trying well, to find out. She's, she's adjusting her jaw. Yeah. But yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> You. It's not funny. It's not I'm sweet. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Every time we film, my alarm goes off. So professional. I am. So professional. Anyway. Oh,